Network. Um, for those I haven't met, my name is Tim Lindsay. Uh, I'm the director of Silas, and sitting over here, bookending the table quite nicely, <laughs> we have Ju Chong Tam, who is the director of the Electoral Regulation Research Network, both of those centres here in the Law School. Um, now, as you've just heard, we are filming tonight, being recorded on video over in the corner there. So um, I'm letting you know in advance that your comments will be recorded too. <laughs> Fair warning. Tonight we have three distinguished speakers and I will introduce each of those prior to their presentation. But before that, let me just say a little bit about our format tonight. Each of our speakers will be given 15 minutes to talk to you on an aspect of political corruption in Indonesia or Australia. Um, when they've finished, Ju Chong and I will interrogate them briefly and then we'll throw it open to the audience in general for questions. And we'll have about half an hour for questions after they present. So start thinking about what you're going to ask them. Start formulating your very, very short questions that are not comments for the end of our session. And we'll also encourage the panel to ask each other questions. Um, money in politics creates huge problems for democracies all around the world. Uh, in fact, studies show, or at least claim, the most serious risks to free and fair elections stem from a failure to effectively deal with the challenges created by money in politics. Tonight we're looking at two very different systems in two very different societies. In fact, probably no two neighbouring countries anywhere in the world that are more different than Indonesia and Australia, with quite different paths to reach their democracies. We'll be looking at how they in fact have similar problems in relation to the role money plays in politics. And we think a little bit about what could be done to prevent it. So let me now begin <coughs> by introducing our first speaker tonight, Professor Denny Indrayana. And Denny is ideally qualified to speak to us tonight because he's an internationally recognized anti-corruption campaigner who has played a key role in law reform efforts in Indonesia, in particular to combat the endemic corruption that is such a massive problem for democracy, politics in general in Indonesia, and in fact for most institutions across Indonesia. Uh, Denny was previously the Vice Minister of Law and Human Rights in Indonesia under the Yudhoyono administration. Before that, he was Special Advisor for Legal Affairs, Human Rights and Anti-Corruption to President Yudhoyono. He was also Chair of the Centre for the Study of Anti-Corruption at Gajamada University, one of Indonesia's leading universities and one of only three universities in the top, from Indonesia in the top 500 universities in the world. He was also Director of Indonesian Court Monitoring, a prominent NGO in Indonesia, uh, seeking to combat judicial corruption. Uh, Denny won his PhD from this law school uh, and in 2009 won the prestigious Australian Alumni Award for Indonesians. Denny is now a visiting professor here as a joint appointment between the Melbourne Law School and the Faculty of Arts. Uh, and at the same time, he remains a professor of constitutional law at his home university, Gajah Mada, where he was one of the youngest people ever to be appointed as a full professor in the law school in Indonesia. Denny has written hundreds of articles and books, and I can think of nobody better qualified to speak about the impact of political corruption in Indonesia than Professor Denny Indriani. Let's welcome him. Thank you for, uh, thank you Tim, for very good, very generous introduction about myself, but one that he didn't tell you guys. Uh, he actually my supervisor when I did my <laughs> doctoral here, doctoral degree. And he did taught, taught me very well, that's why. <laughs> uh, I, well, I want to present my presentation. This is the title, Killing Democracy, Duitocracy and Electoral Corruption in Indonesia. Maybe you, you ask, what is duitocracy? 
duit actually means uh, money in bahasa Indonesia. So, duitocracy therefore when governments rules by money. I am inspired by John Nichols and Robert uh, McChesney who named Indonesia, uh, United States uh, uh, election as US uh, as dollar, dollar crisis. So, I argue Indonesia, in Indonesia, duitocracy has killed our democracy. When we discuss Indonesian elections, uh, under Suharto regime, actually we, we have been improved, under Suharto regime, we don't need the quit count because <laughs> uh, even before the election day, we knew that Golkar Party will win. Golkar Party is the government party. So they always win the election of about 70 percent in average. In 1999, 2002, we had this uh, constitutional reform. Actually, I did my thesis in this uh, research. A uh, new and separate chapter on election was uh, produced, promulgated at the time, uh, covering free and fair principles, type of election, and an independent electoral commission. Under Suharto, actually, the election was uh, administered by Minister of Home Affairs under the executive agency, so it's not independent. However, despite having a better system, uh, Indonesia needs to uh, serious, seriously address uh, our electoral corruption to stop democracy being killed by the duitocracy, money crisis, actually. So the, uh, these are the three problems that I want to address in my presentation. The regulations, uh, the implementation, poor performance of law enforcement, people lack understanding and awareness of electoral corruption, and the influence of oligarchs. Regulation. So we need further electoral reform. One of the reasons is because we have uh, no grand design. For example, our uh, regional head election, because when we, we discuss about election, Indonesia has three elections actually. One is the presidential election, two is the legislative election, and the third one is the regional head election, directly elected by the people. This re uh, regional head election law has been amended four times in these two years. So we have the 2014, 2014, uh, 14 again, because then the SBY at that time issued a government regulation in lieu of law because public criticism uh, of uh, asking about direct uh, regional head election. Then we, we amend the law again in 2015 and we just passed the 2016 amendment on the law. So within two years, we have four uh, laws on the regional head elections. And usually within five years, we keep amending the the laws on election. So this is one of the problems. Loopholes, uh, some of them are no limitation on spending on campaign. And we, we have candidacy baying on the new law of the regional head election, but not yet in the other two elections, in the legislative and presidential election, not yet. So you can do the candidacy baying, but not Candidacy baying means that uh, the candidate actually pay the parties to become candidate. For if you want to become members of parliament as candidate, you pay the parties. If you want to become a candidate of presidential election, then you also may pay the, the, the parties. So basically, there is no candidacy, uh, there, there is no prohibitions. You cannot be go to jail because of this under our presid presidential and ele uh, legislative election. We passed the new law on the, the, the regional head election in 2016. The second issue is political parties. Uh, the case actually involved uh, chair of three parties, ANAS, chair of Democratic Party, the Democrat Party, the, the SBY Party, Surya Dharma Ali, chair of United Development Party, and Lutfi Hasan Ishak. Uh, the numbers of parliament actually shows this is, these are the members, because members of parliament, if you discuss DPR, the House of Representatives, all of them is representing, uh, representing the, the, the political parties. So these numbers are one of the highest. 
uh, and also the you can see the relation between the parties and actually the business people. Party financing is another issue. We have no legal uh, the, the delegate income is not enough, but the illegal uncontrolled. Uh, there are three sources for the income for the parties, members, legal donation from the private and public <coughs> state subsidies, subsidies. Member fee is not effective. According to Burhan Mustadi party ID keeps decreasing now. State subsidies is just not enough. We have prohibition for parties to set up, setting up business entity. The limitation actually one of the highest in the world, one billion for individual, seven five billion for corporations. So actually we have problem with this financing parties. Uh, Nurhalis Majid actually just passed his master degree. Wrote in his paper, twenty five million uh, per seat actually. Uh, 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 allocate for the parties uh, around 108 rupiah per vote, but this is not enough. For example, PDIP, the Megawatt's party, uh, actually have only 1.5 billion in 2009 and should pay 376 in that election year. So it's just not enough. High cost election, of course, in 2004, we, ha we spent 3.5 trillion. In 2009, it increased more than 10 times, 47.9. I, I don't have the numbers for 2014. I think also increased, but I don't have that figures yet. The proportional with open list, list system also created competition among the members of not only different parties, but also intra-party competition. So it's increased the, also the cost. In uh, Pramono Anung now is the cabinet secretary and the pa President Jokowi, uh, his thesis, doctoral thesis, he said that among the members of parliament, they spend between 300 million to 20 billion on election and one actually spend 1 billion only for paying political consultant. Uh, again, this is com campaign finance. The one that reported to the electoral, electoral commissions the spending actually uh, must lower than the real expenditure. So Transparency International Indonesia, uh, for example, for PDIP, others party as well, the same, they report they spend like 3.8.9, but actually on the, the advertising only alone, 100 billion. Uh, Prabowo Hatta, the last 2014 elections, against Jokowi, they said they spent like three, uh, 37, mm, I think billion, yeah? But, a mi yeah, billion, actually supposed to be billion. Uh, this is dollars, not rupiah, sorry. <laughs> 37 billion, but actually, under the University Indonesia Institute for Economic Social Research, they spend more than that. So they reported, they, what they report actually, much more lower than the real uh, uh, expenses. The types of electoral corruption has no different with others. Uh, I think money laundering, candidacy buying, abusive donations, you know, and fraud buying is the most uh, popular one, unfortunately. One of the electoral uh, corruption, very famous one, is when Akil Mohtar, the Chief Justice, consulted court that handed by the Corruption Eradication Commission because he received bribes uh, of uh, some electoral cases. Money politics, these are the modus operandi under Transparency International Indonesia. You can see uh, more than half, 50.87 is actually direct money distribution, usually on the day of the vote. Indonesia Corruption, Corruption Watch also uh, find the same figure in 2014. Cash vote buying is, uh, and goods, goods vote buying is actually uh, very popular, and these are the numbers in 1999. This number is actually very, very low. Maybe the real one is not this, but you can see the trend is keep increasing. One of the NGO on the election, Perludem in Indonesia, also uh, find the same uh, fact that vote buying is uh, the most frequent electoral crime. And actually, cases in the constitutional court in 2014 also shows the same figure. 59 is actually closely related with the money politics as well. 
Unfortunately, with this problem, our law enforcement is ineffective. Again, uh, uh, one of the NGO deals with the electoral election in Indonesia uh, find this figure out of 53 money politics, actually 29 uh, cases only resulted in probationary sentences. And all of them together, 102 only probation. So, and the probation, the sentences is only one month to one year and fines on between 500,000 to three trillion million, uh, three million rupiah, which mean three three hundred dollars. <laughs> so it's very low. So if we qualify that, it's actually very light, uh, light sentence. So that's the effectiveness of the law enforcement. How about voters' behavior? We have this uh, four survey conducted by uh, this one is I think indicator. Indicator is one of the private uh, survey owned by Burhanuddin Muhtadi. Uh, indicator said that the voter actually accept money politics for 41.5 percent, and the uh, figures by Transparency Inter uh, sorry. Uh, the Asia Foundation is more, actually 56% respondent positively perceived of money politics. The Corruption Education Commission has the higher figure, 71.72, the respondent answered that money politics is a common thing. So these are actually the knowledge of the uh, voters on, for example, limitation of personal corporate campaign do donation on uh, more than 66 percent actually they don't know about that limitation so the fifth one i think is one of the most uh, big problem <coughs> the biggest problem now uh, oligarchs media control and elections so again i quote here nur khalis in his paper master paper five out of six indonesian newspaper actually uh, owned by you know almost a hundred percent so it's almost actually 100% controlled by these oligarchs, and they have also parties. Uh, Faisal Basri, this morning, I just read, I just read his uh, site and website. <coughs> he said that uh, Indonesia actually ranked third worst uh, on concentration of wealth, where only 10% on 77%, or 1% on 50.3% of the country's wealth. So, so these oligarchs actually control the media with their parties as well and also of course control the elections so that's uh, the problems and when you come to that very difficult problem what other recommendation I, I said to Tim earlier my recommendation is not I mean it's very difficult to find recommendations but uh, I think one four of them are to have a grand design of more democratic electoral system needed including support for party financing. We are talking maybe about more public state, uh, this, uh, st state subsidized uh, rather than for members because it's not working. Limitation of expenditure on campaign because then you have fairer uh, uh, competition. Clearer and more enforceable provision for money politics. Massive public education to combat electoral corruption, including money politics, because you, you see the fraud behavior, very bad. The, the police, the public prosecutor and judges understanding of electoral corruption should be significantly upgraded, but actually they also part of the problem in terms of judicial corruption, so. Limitation on oligarchs influence and their media ownership. I, I only always stress about this media ownership thing because I think uh, when you control the media, then you can you have you, you increase your ex electability, and that's that's the strategy actually from the parties and their owners. Uh, TV One, uh, one of the biggest TV news in Indonesia, owned by Abu Rizal Bakri, who was to be uh, the chair of Golkar Party. Uh, Surya Palo on Metro TV, the chair now Nasdem, and others parties actually same the same problem. So. Media ownership limitation is something that we need to address very soon. I think that's my presentation. I hope, I don't know, maybe more than 15 minutes. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to talk, to start talking, 
but it's more difficult for me to to stop. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Actually, Jenny, I hate to tell you, it was only 14 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Denny. And uh, if you want to read some more of Denny's recent writing in English, this is a, a, a message from your sponsor. Go to Indonesia at Melbourne blog. That's Indonesia at the word, not the symbol. In Google Indonesia at Melbourne, and you can find our blog. And Denny's recent articles, including one just put up, I think, today or yesterday, about um, the recent dismissal of a minister for holding two passports. Indonesian and American passport. Denny's got his comments on the, the law relevant to that debacle. So read some more of Denny's writing on Indonesia at Melbourne. Enough ads. Our next speaker um, is a second member of a former national government who will be presenting tonight. I think I don't really need to introduce Maxine to an Australian audience, but I'm going to anyway. Um, in 2007, Maxine McHugh wrote herself into Australian political history as only the second candidate ever to have defeated a Prime Minister in his own constituency. <laughs> so, after the uh, fall of John Howard, she entered the Federal Parliament as the MP for Benelong and served as Parliamentary Secretary for Early Childhood and later Parliamentary Secretary for Infrastructure, Regional Development and Local Government. Uh, Maxine is equally well known, I think, to people in this room because before making the switch to politics, she had a 30-year-long career as a broadcast and print journalist, earning a reputation as one of the country's most authoritative interviewers. But tonight, we'll be interviewing her. Um, Maxine is also a director of the John Cain Foundation, which earlier this year produced this booklet, come this report, I should say, Come Clean, Stopping the Arms Race in Political Donations, a research paper by Colleen Lewis, um, which is looking at the problems of political donations in the Australian context in particular. Maxine is now a Vice-Chancellor's Fellow at this university and a Distinguished Fellow also at this university's Australia in the India Institute, and she has been very busy in that role across many faculties and disciplines here. So we're very pleased uh, that she's been able to give up time and come to speak to us. Tonight she's going to speak to us about two topics, the IBAC revolu revelations, revolutions, the IBAC <laughs> revelations of corruption within the Victorian Department of Education and corruption issues arising from our loose election campaign finance laws. So for our comparison now between the two countries, can you welcome Maxine? Uh, about a week after the July federal election, a press report revealed that Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull had tipped a million dollars of his own money into Liberal Party coffers, the better to boost the opportunities for a final big spend on advertising. Now, notably, this report has not been denied, but we have been told that all political donations will be disclosed in the usual manner. Now, that is up to a year after voters have cast their decisions, so sometime in 2017. Now, in a country that has no limits or caps, and there is some overlap here with what we've heard from Denny, um, no caps or on uh, amounts that can be donated to political parties, nor any requirement for on-time disclosure, the Prime Minister's largesse can hardly be called corrupt. But I would argue that it is corrupting, and it is most certainly a gross distortion and a major barrier to Australia being able to claim that it observes anything like best practice when it comes to elections and how they are funded. Earlier this year, um, as Tim said, on behalf of the John Cain Foundation, I commissioned a report from uh, Professor Colleen Lewis at Monash. She spent a lifetime looking at governance issues. And we call this report Come Clean uh, for a very good reason. It was really a call to arms for a much more transparent system. We referred to a cowboy culture of vote buying, the casual way that the liberal Labor duopoly regularly hold fundraisers and conferences where special access is provided, with a very large dollar figure attached for the privileged few. 
We mentioned as well the $20 million that Clive Palmer's PUP party managed to spend at the 2013 poll, where of course Palmer boasted some time later that it was a good spend because it got rid of a mining tax that he considered injurious to his business interests. Not that different from what you've been describing, Dean. The report listed as well the many examples of egregious behaviour that now pass almost as normal. Union slush funds, attempts to game the system in New South Wales to avoid the ban on money from developers, that's the state ban, and perhaps most jaw-dropping of all, Tony Abbott's belated admission that as a younger MP, a well-known millionaire handed him $5,000 in cash as a Christmas present. Hardly surprising that the result of all of this, I think, is diminished trust in our politicians and in our institutions. And of course, others are watching. Transparency International ranks Australia poorly when it comes to key measures on their corruption index. We have fallen six places since 2012 and are now ranked number 13 against other democracies. What stands out when we are compared with others is that our fragmented approach, that is that we have different rules in every state and territory, our fragmented approach escalates, as they say, the risk of corruption. Now, on the plus side, the recent election saw a much greater focus on this deficit than I can recall from previous campaigns. In part, this is because the stench has now become so great and the revelations and implications from bodies such as New South Wales ICAC cannot be ignored. I think there is also a sense from many citizens here that unless we are very careful, we will end up with the best democracy that money can buy. Now we add to this, I think, a heightened concern about what we see beyond our shores. Um, I think um, a, a group such as this would probably agree we are living through an extraordinary moment where just about everything, or about everyone, seems to have ripped up the rule book. If you consider this roll call of a world out of joint, we've had Britain's vote to void a 40-year international agreement with its European neighbours, the shocking blowback from ISIS and attacks on civilian citizens, the nomination of one of the least qualified candidates in US history to run as the choice of the Republicans in the November US elections, the rapid slide of Turkey into a repressive state with the recent arrest of thousands of people, including, of course, academics and teachers. And, of course, the refusal of China in our own neighbourhood to accept the judgement of the International Court in relation to its maritime activities. Well, what about the land of Oz? Well, of course, not in the same class as the above, but we did have a bit of a mini meltdown recently, didn't we, when we couldn't manage to run a national, national census. I, I noted that something called distribution denial um, was, was apparently to blame. Uh, for those of you who mark student papers, I don't know if you do this anymore, Tim, but I expect this will be the new academic excuse. I'm terribly sorry I couldn't get this assignment in because of distribution denial. Just wait for it, wait for it. Now, we, well, that's it. That unwanted email, all of that, exactly. Look, we'll survive this. But the point I'm making is that um, this discombobulated world is unsettling many. With few certainties, a total disregard, I think, for established conventions, with the loudest and often most extreme uh, garnering so much attention, I think the tendency may be for the rest of us to, you know, pull back a bit, to retreat, to wait it out. Now, I would caution against that. And here's why. In my own lifetime, I've seen what happens when a citizenry, and I mean that part of the citizenry we call the informed citizenry. For too long, Bielke Peterson was treated as a bit of a joke or as an irritant by his southern peers, when in fact he was creating a one-party state with all interest groups and institutions implicitly understanding that things were somehow different north of the border. They were different, all right. A unicameral parliament, no oversight committees, a Labour opposition that was more interested in internal spoils than in taking the fight to the government, and, with a few exceptions, a supine fourth estate. So a place with no checks and balances, 
and where finally even the police force and the judiciary, importantly, were seen as mere extensions of executive rule. As I say, for a long time this was tolerated. It actually took the exposure of some outsiders, uh, principally Chris Masters' Moonlight State report on Four Corners in the mid-1980s, to start the ball rolling, which led to the investigations of Tony Fitzgerald QC and the eventual upending of a corrupt and shameful period in modern Australian governance. Now, here's the point. What I've observed over the years is a bit of smug superiority by the other states about this history. You know, the, oh, well, that was Queensland. You know, Australia's Alabama. <laughs> Couldn't happen here. Well, we now know how misplaced that is. Much the same set of attitudes that prevailed in Queensland 30 years ago have infected certain politicians in New South Wales. The notion that elected office is there to be used for personal benefit, that's the principle that took hold. And it's only via the ICAC investigations in New South Wales that we actually know about this. Let's move closer to home. The recent IBAC investigations here in Victoria have revealed a level of corrupt practice that actually I consider to be the most disgraceful of all. The misuse of funds, up to $2 million, and possibly more, not by politicians, but by senior officers of the Department of Education. Teachers, educators, senior education public servants. This is something quite different from anything I think we've encountered in Australia before. And it's happened in a state that prides itself on good governance and the maintenance of a certain kind of civic virtue. In brief, what's been revealed is that over a seven-year period, seven-year period, a group of senior officials, which operated as an exclusive and influential club at the top of the departmental hierarchy, siphoned money meant for disadvantaged schools into a set of perks that advantaged the key perpetrators. Lunches, overseas travel and the like. If you were part of the club, lucky you. You got a few of the crumbs um, from uh, um, the operation as well. But anyone who tried to challenge this, and there were a few brave souls, well, they were sidelined or sacked. Now, it may be the understatement of all time. The IBAC commissioner, Stephen O'Brien, said, said, the knowledge that funds intended to support the education of some of the state's most disadvantaged children were diverted by senior departmental officers for their own personal gain is understandably a cause for significant public concern. Well, given that what was exposed amounted to serious and systemic corruption over a very long period, it is remarkable that no departmental secretary or minister has either claimed responsibility or suffered any setback. But you know, the people who continue, and I work in the education faculty just down the road, the people who continue to feel the immense blowback from all of this are operating every day in schools across the state. If you talk to any Victorian principal now, they'll tell you that you know, such are the, the new, um, very strict um, departmental protocols, understandably, because that's what's in place now. But it's hard if you're a principal to even get permission to, you know, to get a bus fare to go to a regional conference. So that's the effect of this sort of terrible beh behaviour. Now I'm mentioning this because I think it helps explain the grumpiness, you know, the orneriness that we now see in the Australian electorate today. Many citizens sense, and I think with good reason, that our once trusted institutions are no longer primarily in the business of providing a public service. That no matter the elaborate vision statements, that something, something like service is almost incidental to the main game of branding and big noting. So, to come back to the title of our John Cain paper, come clean and the, the precise topic tonight. How do we come clean? I think it is surely up to our political representatives to at least care enough to set higher standards on a range of things and by so doing to restore some integrity to our system. But the, you know, there's also an important role for all of us. We can't be passive bystanders. A starting point, I think, is sustained advocacy and pressure on the new parliament to reform our inadequate campaign finance laws. Too many individuals and special interest groups actually like the system exactly the way it is. 
And that goes for people who are members of the Parliament's Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. But you know, I think it is worth shooting for something close to what the Canadians have enshrined for their federal elections. That is strict caps on individual donations around a maximum of $1,500 a ban on third-party campaigns during the election period, and certainly on-time disclosure. None of this business of you know, going to the polls and then you know, 12 months later you find out who has been funding whom. Of course, what Australia also desperately needs is nationally consistent laws and a ban on foreign donations. At the moment, we have wide variation, as I say, across the states. There is some reason, reason for optimism, New South Wales has led the way with the, this is just as a state, they've led the way with the strongest set of rules around campaign financing, including a total ban on money from certain groups, such as developers. Further to that, Labor opposition leader Luke Foley has committed his party to on-time disclosure of all donations for the next state election. And he's instructed his own party secretariat to prepare the necessary infrastructure. He made the point that disclosure delayed is disclosure denied. Now what happens when we come to south of the New South Wales border? Well, there's been a deafening silence here from Luke Foley's Labor counterparts. Victoria actually is the real laggard in this area. Great pity. At the federal level, I've just got a couple of minutes more. At the federal level, the Labor Party, as well as the Greens, are committed to greater transparency and tighter rules. But really, one only has to look at the level of largesse that both currently enjoy to see that the arm wrestling on this will be pretty interesting. Adam Bant's fortunes in Melbourne were boosted by a reported $300,000 donation from the Electrical Trades Union. And the Labor Party's campaign was helped immensely by paid organisers in key marginal seats, organisers paid for by the ACTU. Now, one can easily see the gridlock. The coalition will be reluctant to set caps on corporate or other donations if barriers are also not set on union contributions, either monetary or in kind. That's where the real arm wrestling will be. Still, I think more than likely as a result of ongoing internal scandals within the New South Wales Liberal Party, both Malcolm Turnbull and the uh, Cabinet Secretary, Arthur Sinodinas, have given in principle support to change. Again, highlighting the problem of inconsistent state laws and delayed disclosure. Another point of tension, of course, will be around levels of public funding, with likely suggestions that this should be increased if other funding sources are curbed. My own view is that, in fact, we have a very generous system of public funding. Most of our elections are actually funded by all of you, by taxpayers. An early test will be the way that the new Standing Committee on Electoral Matters conducts itself. Certainly no one wants a rerun of what we reported uh, in Colleen Lewis's report, that um, over the past year, in the, in the run-up to this election, there were five different chairpersons of that committee. Imagine that. Five, how do you get new continuity or new direction when you're having rotating chairpersons? The John Cain Foundation will be continuing to highlight this matter and to monitor parliamentary developments, and we welcome your support on this. The challenge is no different from that set out by John Faulkner in his 2008 Green Paper. This is what he said, and I'll end on this note. The choice before us is whether we seek to adapt ourselves or to throw up our hands and allow participants in the political system to do what they like. Given the importance of political financing to the conduct of elections, the structure of our political system, and the operation of political parties and other political actors, it is incumbent on governments to engage with these questions and to take active steps to ensure that our democracy evolves in ways consistent with the expectations and requirements of citizens. Thank you. Let's now make welcome our third speaker, Alison Byrne. Alison is a lawyer with some 15 years' experience in criminal and civil litigation policy development investigation and compliance and most relevantly for tonight she is executive director for funding disclosure and compliance at the new south wales electoral commission and we're very grateful to you for coming down to join us tonight um, funding disclosure and compliance or fdc is a multidisciplinary team responsible for regulating compliance with donations expenditure and disclosure election and lobbying laws 
It also administers statutory registers under various legislation and the public funding scheme in New South Wales. And Alison is part of our panel because we've heard from two people who are involved in national governments and in policy development and in the, the debates. Alison's going to talk to us about the practicalities of enforcement and compliance. So can you please make welcome our third speaker. So for the 2015 state general election in New South Wales, there was over $92 million in circulation that we know of. That's made up of just over $50 million on electoral expenses, approximately $16 million received in donations, and about $25.5 million in public funding grants. But what about the money we don't know about? What about the dark money? The New South Wales Electoral Commission is responsible for the administration and regulation of three pieces of legislation in New South Wales. The Parliamentary Electorates and Elections Act prescribes the conduct of elections, the processes and systems for New South Wales state elections. The Lobbying of Government Officials Act prescribes the regulations for third party lobbyists in New South Wales and the Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act, which is what I'll speak to tonight. Now those three acts work together, albeit not as well as they could, to provide a framework to the democratic process in New South Wales. The Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act governs the registration of electoral participants for campaign finance purposes, donations made to and received by the registered electoral participants, the expenditure incurred, the management and disclosure of that expenditure and those donations, and finally, the claims for public funding. As you've heard, my team, the Funding Disclosure and Compliance Branch, is responsible for ensuring that electoral com participants comply with the laws around campaign <coughs> finance. Now, we foster compliance through a variety of methods and means, everything ranging from stakeholder education and support client services, risk-based audits, intelligence gathering, investigations, and finally through enforcement actions. And enforcement actions range from warnings, cautions, to fines, compliance agreements, prosecutions, and recovery of unlawful donations. We, as well as other stakeholders, have for many years advocated for reform of the Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act. That's reform to recognise the differences between our parties and electoral participants. Reform to enhance the New South Wales Electoral Commission's enforcement powers. And reform to ensure that the laws reflect the objectives of transparent, fair and clean campaign finances. In December 2014, the Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act was amended again to include a statement of objectives. So relevant for tonight's purposes, those objectives include to establish a fair and transparent election funding expenditure and disclosure scheme, to facilitate public awareness of political donations, and to help prevent corruption and undue influence in the government of the state or local government. Tonight I want to talk about transparency. In the world of campaign finance, transparency is not just an end. It's a means, and a very important means, to a number of ends. Transparency breeds accountability. It imposes standards. It fosters higher standards. And it promotes fairness. It brings out into the daylight, for everyone to see, the management, the practices, and the money of our political system and our electoral participants. 
It's hard for corruption to thrive in the daylight. There's an area of practice in New South Wales campaign finance that, whilst not against the law, goes against what people might consider to be within the spirit and intent of that law. It's an area that reduces transparency, has the potential to create inequity, and in the hands of someone who's willing to push the boundaries, it can lead to corruption. That's the area of dark money. In New South Wales, there's a type of electoral participant called the third party campaigner. A third party campaigner is defined under the Act as an entity or other person, not being a party, elected member, candidate or group, who incurs electoral communication expenditure for an election during a capped expenditure period that exceeds $2,000 in total. So third party campaigners can accept donations, incur expenditure, campaign throughout the year just like candidates and parties, but they're only regulated during the capped expenditure period. And the capped expenditure period is the six months before an election. And they're only regulated in relation to a subset of expenditure, and that's electoral communication expenditure. So you'll see that third party campaigners can do whatever they want for three and a half years of a four year election cycle, and they're not required to disclose or account for their money and financial management during that period. We won't know who they are until they register during the capped expenditure period. And in fact, a third party campaigner can register up to seven days before an election. So for three and a half years, a TPC can raise money, accept donations and spend money, and there's no obligation on them to disclose this activity and the rules that apply to parties and candidates and to party and candidate donations and expenditure don't apply to them. The only exception is in relation to whether, um, to when a third party campaigner makes a donation and they must disclose that donation if it's over $1,000 in New South Wales as a donor, but only as a donor. You might think that this is an area uh, of the law that allows for opacity and impenetrability. We can't see what third party campaigners are doing and who they're doing it with. For three and a half years, that's roughly 87% of an election cycle, they can operate with relative immunity under the Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act, and they provide impunity to the electoral participants that they associate with. Then when they are required to disclose, <coughs> that disclosure is quite limited. Third party campaigner, when they disclose, they disclose only the activities during the capped expenditure period, that six months period. They do not disclose information such as whether they are associated with a particular candidate or party. They don't disclose for whose benefit a particular event or campaign was targeted or whether the third party campaigner campaign was for or against a particular party or candidate. And finally, they don't, don't include their annual financial accounts and records. Now, I have to say at this point that this is not about the existence of third party campaigners or associated entities. It's not about their ability to campaign. It's not about the debate about their growing prevalence and, and power in New South Wales elections. I'm not concerned with that for present purposes. What concerns me is the imperviousness of these entities and the money that flows through them. There's a lot of money that's not regulated, for which entities are not accountable and which we can't see. <coughs> this is dark money. It's analogous, you might say, to the situation in the United States of America, where recent years have seen the, the success of political action committees, super PACs, and special non-profit uh, organisations, and their donations and expenditure have come to be known as dark money. Now, depending on the type of group and the type of election that they operate in, in those situations, there can be no limits on donations, no limits on their expenditure, and no requirement on them to disclose who their donors are. 
The dark money raised by the PACs and other associations and entities in the US is fast becoming greater than the money raised by the electoral participants themselves. Analysis has shown that the war chests built up by these groups influence the outcome of elections and therefore can influence the people and parties who stand to gain by winning those elections. So I'll take you back now to New South Wales and the recent ICAC inquiries. Now those inquiries have highlighted what I would say is the slippery slope in affiliating with such entities. Entities that weren't captured by New South Wales law, that could rightfully accept donations and incur expenditure, but the evidence would suggest, were used by political parties to accept donations that the parties themselves were not allowed to accept to spend money over the caps that were imposed on the parties and to provide anonymity to those who sought to influence parties and the political agenda for their own gain. The evidence has shown that anonymity, concealed associations and different rules for different players creates a greater appetite for risk, a sense of entitlement and a view that if everyone's doing it, so can I. So a number of Australian and international jurisdictions recognise associated entities. The definitions differ over the various jurisdictions, but generally speaking, these are entities that are controlled by a political party or that operate for the benefit of a party. At Commonwealth level, an associated entity means an entity that's controlled by or operates wholly or to a significant extent for the benefit of one or more registered political parties, an entity that's a financial member or on whose behalf another person is a financial member of a registered political party, or an entity that has voting rights or on whose behalf another person has voting rights in the registered political party. Associated entities are not regulated in New South Wales. But recent reviews of the Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act and regime in New South Wales conducted by uh, the Expert Panel and the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters have recommended the inclusion of associated entities within our legislation. I'd submit that recognition and regulation of associated entities would resolve many of the issues I've raised tonight from the current treatment of third party campaigners under the legislation and would bring transparency to this area. So how we increase that transparency and, and what do we need to know? Just to finish up, um, I'd submit that a combination of re requirements drawn from other jurisdictions would, would do a good job of um, of introducing information to the public that they can use to assess where the money's coming from, who the money's going to, and who's associated with whom in an election. What it would do is require these entities to disclose periodically uh, and also be open to review and audit by the Electoral Commission in relation to these matters. They'd have to disclose the parties, the elected members, the candidates, groups and other entities with whom they associate, whether their campaign or event was for or against a particular electoral participant, the donations received and made throughout the period to the entity and by whom, the identities of recipients of their donations and other financial benefits made by the entity, capital contributions to the entity and again by whom, and the financial accounts and records, including audited annual financial statements of the entities. Uh, alongside this, electoral participants would also be required to disclose their associations as part of their annual return. So that process would allow for a reconciliation, of course. Political corruption, it, it rarely occurs in the daylight where there are witnesses and a strong regulatory presence. So if you shine a light on the dark money that those entities operate <coughs> with and the grey area that they operate in, you'll bring a greater awareness 
of how much money is at play, who the players are, and how they relate to one another. This transparency, it would have a snowball effect, creating greater public awareness of the money involved in politics. It would create fairness between the, or more fairness between electoral participants, and it would help to prevent corruption and undue influence in the government of the state. Thank you. So thank you very much, Alison, and you've given us a, a very concrete and closely argued proposal for reform. We've got about half an hour for questions now, and we're going to start uh, with some questions for our panel before throwing it open to the floor. Let me just begin by asking the members of the panel if any of you have got questions you might want to put to each other. <laughs> Big voice, has, uh, big has voice. The, has the New South Wales government responded to that? I assume that recommendation from the top people. Is that right? Has there been any official response to that suggestion uh, about the, associated entities? Yes. Straight after the shot report, the panel of expert report came out, the um, Premier and government responded with in principle support to all but one of the recommendations. And then that report went to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters for a review and further recommendation. And the Joint Standing Committee did recommend that inclusion of associated entities in the legislation. Right. And that came through uh, only a couple of months ago. Right, right. Mm. Okay. Is Waiting for mm. for some sort of change <laughs> in our DPC mm. and, a, and an announcement that the legislation will be reviewed. I've got a question for Denny. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yes. You spoke of law enforcement in relation to electoral offences and, and voting and bribery. Who polices um, the matters of election bribery and corruption in elections in Indonesia? Is it the, the normal police force or is there a different body? Uh, the normal police, but under the new law in 2016 for the regional heads, they actually tried to... Uh, uh, accelerate the process by establishing what we call the uh, uh, joint force between the police, the public prosecutor, and you know they try to accelerate the process because they have this time limit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the process should be uh, should be end before before the whole election process actually uh, submitted to the to the. To, to be to be to be to be finalized by the electoral commission, who is the winner, who is the winning of the election? Mm. So they have this time limit between within those those periods. That's why uh, they try to accelerate. But actually, it's still the same police. Uh, on the judges, they have requirement. So the judges should know should have knowledge about elections, but should have this uh, 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 minimum period of. Of, of of their uh, service, uh, I think about uh, 10 years, something like that. But this is only for the new law in 2016. They try to establish this. Uh, and we, we also have this deadline, time limit, I mean, I mean, uh, for the for the uh, uh, election dispute. Now it's actually under the constitutional court, constitutional court jurisdiction, but in 2020, 2029, we try to establish a new election court, uh, you know, to, to settle all these administrative issues, uh, criminal issues, because we divide it between this administrative, criminal, and ethical uh, bridge. So it's different. For ethical, it should be, uh, should be determined by uh, what we call the, uh, actually, the electoral commission themselves. For, for the criminal, they go to the uh, criminal court, but for the, uh, the the result, I mean the, the the result dispute, it goes to the constitutional court. So we have these three different ways to to settle the the problem, the dispute. Hmm. Yeah. Another thing we have in common, though, of course, that you, you talked about very low penalties. Yes. Um, we have risable penalties here as as well. When we discuss about uh, you know the maximum is three years. And actually, 36 million is actually very low in in terms of of the impact. Maybe, and it's actually the the one that got convicted is 
you know the it's not the the high ranking of the mm. cabinet actually mm. the, the 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 one in uh, the lower that uh, lower level that you know so it has not that trans effect at all mm. while in the high le- high level they they tends to agree each other you know not to to attack it they they know that they they also pilot this uh, money politics the constitutional court for example when they tried these uh, petitions from the Jokowi the or, or Mega or not Mega from Prabowo y- usually the, the the decision will be yes there is a uh, money politic conducted by uh, this candidate but also the other one too did the same thing so you know so uh, and it's not uh, the, 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 the the money politic actually did not uh, uh, have no consequences to the winner I mean mm-hmm. so there is money politic, but the winner still uh, Jokowi because also uh, Prabowo did the same thing, something like that. <laughs> so, so it's in the two in the two candidate race. Mm-hmm. Yes, in the, the two candidate race in 2014, and mm-hmm. others uh, decision usually say the same thing that it's not systematic. If it is not systematic, it's not structuralist, uh, structured, mm-hmm. and it's not massive. Massive means uh, you know it's not only in some part of the the place nation nation nationwide then it's not it, 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 it will not be considered as something that uh, should be should change the result of the election and, and then does that mean you have to satisfy all three it has to be systematic structured and massive yes so you could be massive and structured but not very systematic and you'll get off <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> and, 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 and it is not it did not uh, impact the consequence i mean the the result it will be uh, uh, you 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 have more three million votes, but if the difference is six million, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. It's yeah. irrelevant. You know, yeah. you, there is uh, money politics. So it, actually, you really there is vote buying, but yeah. it is it it, it will not uh, the result will not it, it's yeah. still the same. <laughs> so so to actually be um, for there to be serious legal consequences, it would have to be an overwhelming act of corruption in right across the board in a single election. Yeah, that's about the that, that's about the 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 the, uh, uh, the dispute on election results. Yeah, mm. but you can go to the criminal one. Mm. So in under the two thousand uh, the two thousand sixteen new law for the regional head elections, if actually if the candidate got elected governors elected but then there is a final and bending decision the court said he beat this criminal money politics for, for example mm-hmm. he can be impeached mm-hmm. at, at but the criminal court uh, the criminal process not go through the yeah. the, 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 so the election dispute but the, the, the results would not be themselves moved that the candidate would be removed mm-hmm. not the candidate <laughs> Even when he g- he got elected and inaugurated as the governor elected, he can be removed from the office mm. based on the uh, criminal court, uh, not criminal decision, criminal cases mm. that he has this uh, for buying, for example. But, but so this is this is under the new the new 2016 law. Mm. But you sort of see the, the issue here: you got a level playing field based on corrupt practices on both parts, <coughs> the, both the major parties, and that's why you actually don't have a discernible. Yes, Fairness among corrupt parties, if you like, uh, and there's a parallel here. In quality the qual- of corruption. That's right, exactly. Quality. Cor- I mean, and, and I think uh, perhaps to um, uh, you know s- lesser extent, but this is part of the problem in Australia too, where there's a shared interest in unsavoury fundraising practices, and that's what actually is you know ho- holding the status quo in place. I had a question that follows from that for all three. I mean. Um, we know from experience that reform is not impossible. I mean, New South Wales is an example, but Queensland, <coughs> ACT, South Australia, and as I understand it too, a deal was very close to being done under the Rudd government between Malcolm Turnbull as the opposition leader that would have enacted many of the things that you were suggested, Maxine. So my question was that, what do you see mm-hmm. as for the <coughs> key conditions for genuine reform? I mean, we have the diagnosis, we have the prescription in terms of measures. What might be the key conditions for genuine reform actually being opened up. Uh, well, I look, I'll have a stab at that. Um, uh, the, the question you've raised, actually, um, it's a bit of um, urban, it's an urban oh, myth. It is an urban myth, and I have to say, I, I can quote no higher authority. Than, sorry, I asked um, John Faulkner about this, you know, this, this sort of, uh, I think it was 
Michael, not Michael Yapsley, but it was one of the Liberals in New South Wales who raised this at one of the forums we held before the election. Yeah. Ah, there was a deal on the table, yeah, yeah. you know, da 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 da, and Rudd walked away yeah. from it. And I said to Joe, I said, what is this about? He said, I have no idea. And then he, he went through the entire history of how his green paper went, went down and, and all yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. You know, and it's all very exceptionally well documented. So I think we can put that one okay. uh, to, okay. the, to one side. But look, I, I just, I come back to so many institutional barriers. Um, you're right, the, both major parties have, have a big interest in um, not having the light shone in the dark places. They like those dark places. Mm. All sorts of uh, interesting mouldy things grow in those dark places, you know, and, all, and it makes a lot of, you know, things possible. Um, and interestingly, some of those people who dwell in those dark places get themselves um, elected over and over again onto the Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. It's very interesting to look at who's on these, you know, things. You know, mm, that's why nothing gets done. Uh, but look, we do know that uh, uh, this is the sort of thing, uh, I have to say the, the Liberals will never ever be to the fore in this area. We only have public funding because um, this was taken up by, by the Hawke government in the, in the 80s and it was largely opposed by the Liberals, but we have the broadly the system of public funding that has evolved um, be because of a previous Labor government. Um, I tend to think, as I say, as said in my um, prepared remarks, the stench really has become so great um, and some very significant figures have been pinged. Um, for instance, I mean, there was a lot of, um, it's no secrets all in the public record, um, the, the, shall we say, the, the forgetfulness of Senator Arthur Sinodinus, um, now uh, reconfirmed as um, Cabinet Secretary um, in relation to all sorts of matters that came before um, ICAC in New South Wales. Uh, certainly, I suggest, um, led him to become a latter-day reformer, a convert to the whole idea of reform. There's nothing quite like sort of feeling a bit of, bit of sweat. For you to say, I'm moving out of the dark corner and I'm moving into the light, you know? So I think there's a little bit, so I don't really, you know, sometimes, you know, for, for bad reasons, good things, good, good things can come. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very, very cautiously feeling that there, there is a moment, there is an opportunity here. Um, we've yet to hear the, the next big report from um, ICAC in New South Wales, which one expects will be a very substantial document. Um, <clears throat> and an embarrassing one for some people. Um, <laughs> So that, in fact, one can see that it's in the interests of a lot of the, the major players now to sort of, OK, OK, we'll tackle this. My fear is that it will end up being lowest common denominator. We won't end up with what, if you like, the Canadians have at the federal level. Although I no notice that the Canadian provinces, you, you're the expert on this, Jay, the, the Canadian provinces aren't all exactly in sync, are they? No. At the federal level, though, um, they have bipartisan support for really quite a strong set of, yeah. of campaign finance yeah. laws. Ontario's virtually been regulated. Is that, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So it is, yeah. it's a mixed picture in their, in yeah. their provinces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what does tend to happen, um, uh, for instance, you go, um, there, there's the whole lot of grey area here. You, as Colleen Lewis found out, when she went, went to the electoral commissions around the states, some, some of the states will, they have barely any legislation at all. And they'll either say, oh, we tend to follow the feds or whatever. There's some very, very, you know, thin, ropey practices. Um, Victoria will say that, oh, we tend to follow um, um, the, um, the feds. So certainly if uh, Mike Baird, the Premier of New South Wales, to his credit, um, pushed to have this put on the COAG agenda, that's where it needs to be. Um, but of course, it wasn't on the formal COAG agenda. I think it got, you know, discussed for about five minutes when they passed the port at the COAG dinner, that sort of thing. Well, it needs to be sort of um, um, much more seriously considered than that. Thanks, Francine. Steve, John, do you want to say something about the Canada situation? You've mentioned it a couple of times. Oh, oh it is a can the Canadian regulatory framework. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in that broad sense that you mentioned, I mean, they've got. Uh, uh, caps on political contributions. Uh, they've got uh, caps on spending. This is at the at the national level, mm. and um, they've got very significant uh, public funding, um, and they do have a ban on on foreign donations. But I should just add, in that respect, I mean the, the, the High Court found in University of New South Wales here that a ban on foreign donations is actually in breach of the, the implied freedom under the Constitution. So that's mm -hmm. a, a problem there. But uh, it's a mixed picture uh, uh, provin uh, provincially. Um, and it, you're right. It's uh, it's uh, and I think the Canadian the Canadian system 
provides good lessons in terms of regulatory measures, but I think the other thing it provides a good lesson too is about perhaps one way you could actually get bipartisan support. So the framework that actually set up, it was pretty much set up around the 1970s uh, and 80s, and it followed a royal commission that actually, you know, in a, co a comprehensive investigation, laid down principles and said, okay, these are the principles, principles you all agree on, fair elections, mm. free elections, preventing corruption, then how do we set out the measures, you know, uh, and cater to the self-interest, not the problem here, it's about self-interest, illegitimate self-interest being served, yeah. rather than legitimate mm. self-interest mm. being served. So a question then from you, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I was obviously asking the question. <laughs> asking you, yeah. And that is, uh, do you think then Canada is a reasonable model for Australia to look to, or do we need a sort of world commission to do that? Well, I, I think New South Wales, uh, whenever I'm asked, I, I say New South Wales is an excellent starting point. Um, uh, we've got a, something that... Problems. Sorry? <laughs> well, but the problems that arise in New South Wales are not uh, because of the regulatory framework, they're despite the regulatory framework. I mean, what we see in terms of the reports is uh, the reason why these things are being called out is because they're breaching the law. But these same practices would be perfectly legal in this country, in this state. Mm -hmm. Taking money from property developers, you know, uh, taking money in excess of, uh, there are no caps in this state. So it's, it's not because of the laws, it's despite the laws. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what do you think about Canada? Yeah. Is that a model for us? Uh, no, look, uh, in a very broad sense, but uh, the New South Wales, uh, New South Wales regime has all the, the broad elements of the Canadian system, but you have it actually tailored to an Australian context. Mm. And I think one important difference with the Canadian context and Australian context is the trade union issue. Mm. You mm. You've got trade unions affiliated with the Labour Party and that is gonna be, this is the line in the path that needs to be slayed. Uh, I mean, that particular problem needs to be solved in a way that seems to be fair. Whereas what you had in Canada was that you, you had a more a third party, the, the, the New Democratic Party having trade unions affiliated, but they were actually happy not to have trade union money come in, even though that a form of labor union process. But you don't have that sentiment mm. here. No, nobody in the Labour Party is saying, let's sever the ties, or not. Yes. The overall majority are not saying that, yeah. you know, uh, yes. sever the ties yeah. with the trade union. So Could I just say, Tim, I, I don't think we need a Royal Commission on this. We have report after report after report yeah. after report. I mean, at the end of this, you know, the, there's, there's a huge reference list of all of them. And Alison's reference to Dr. Kerry Schott's report yeah. um, is, is an important one. It, it, it really is a very, very comprehensive mm -hmm. uh, document with complete bipartisan buy-in, by the way. Um, uh, John Watkins, a former Labor Deputy Premier, mm -hmm. uh, was on that uh, uh, report uh, with Kerry Schott, as mm -hmm. was, um, um, who was the, the Liberal Andrew guy? Tink. Andrew Tink, mm -hmm. um, former Liberal Minister. So you had, as I say, bipartisan buy-in, um, and, and Schott is really late. She has looked at all of the international evidence it is a very, very good mm -hmm. blueprint to be taken up, and she makes this point about, as I say, you know, the the, the problem of, of national lack of well, the fragmentation of the laws and the cost of that to us. So you know. comes up the political will. Well, and mm. um, it does, it does. Mm. 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 Yeah, and I think part of, part of the issue here is people's un uh, well, both the there's an interesting disjuncture between the public's understanding of what is corruption and what is the understanding amongst part of the elite. Well, in fact, you have the public having mu much more nuance and broader develop understanding what corrupt like corruption is not just about uh, you know quid pro quo corruption money exchange that includes that but goes beyond that. that you can actually see corruption of the system. You can see corruption of elections. Whereas you know uh, the key parts of the political elite that hold on to a very crap view of corruption, which basically is it about brown paper bags, mm -hmm. you know, and solely about that. Mm -hmm. And if it's even you're selling excess, that's not corruption because hey we can't guarantee you an outcome at the end of that, even though we're just guaranteeing you excess. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you to our panel. I think we should now go to questions. We've had the chance to think about very, very short questions. Um, we have a, we, let's direct them to any of the members of the panel and to Sue Chong. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're in the final line. <laughs> um, if we have a tradition here, can you give your name and any affiliation, please? So um, you can have the first question today. Yeah, uh, my name is Chima. Uh, I'm here in Ontario, Master of Public Policy. So uh, I know um, there have been a lot of um, arguments about whether the, the way we portray corruption in the beginning is really overblown. So my question is, is there really um, 
is corruption or can corruption really be justified? Is there any way to justify corruption? Mm -hmm. Can uh, it be justified? Keep in mind the concept of um, mm -hmm. noble cause. Mm -hmm. Noble cause? Yeah, noble cause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, there's a concept called uh, noble cause, which mostly applies to um, security officials when they do some sort of um, corrupt practices. So anyone on our panel want to answer that? Can corruption ever be justified? The example of for example, if the security officials knew <coughs> engaged in corrupt practices for the national interest, etc. Any comments? Mm. I can. I think um, noble corruption came up in uh, a number of. Uh, inquiries and commissions into police corruption many, many years ago in New South Wales and some other states. And that's a, you know, particular examples of police officers putting a, a weapon in the bag of a known criminal. You know, he, he didn't commit this crime, but we know he's committed all these others. So, you know, get him off the streets. It's a, it's a good job done because it achieves what you think. You're the judge and jury. You think about being for the greater good suddenly you're entitled to make those judgments and everybody has, at the end of the day, um, you know, some biases and, and some concepts that are different to others. And so in the political world, I think that that would carry true too as well, and that is no, there has to be black and white when it comes to corruption because, again, the grey <coughs> area, just things can go mouldy. Okay, question. Yes, my name is Rima, I'm a PhD student from Social Science and Political Studies, University of Melbourne. I would like to direct this question to Professor Wendy and Diana, because like how, if I'm talking about in a different context, like how can design a psychology to become a, like a solution, considering that even <laughs> the presence of strong regulatory framework, for example, in a country like Australia or in even any other countries that have strong regulatory presence um, has not been quite effective to curb political uh, corruption. This is just to, you know, like mentioning the fact that as long as Indonesian retain in an electoral system that, um, how to say, depends on the um, per strong personal votes, mm. so that the incentives of the politician to actually um, build support from the money politics remains high. And not to mention that it's not only vote buying, not only campaign speed, but actually the most crucial fact is actually the institutionalized patronage, mm. which become the very heart of our political system. Mm. Okay, stop you there. Yeah, see, that's very a very good uh, uh, argument there, but uh, still, I think uh, our election system need this, you know. Uh, uh, better, better regulation, better laws. Uh, in fact, uh, the laws actually contribute to the to the better elections uh, um, uh, within this uh, reform era. I agree with you that uh, it's not only about the, the regulation. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned about the the, the <coughs> oligarchs, the patrons, and uh, I think. Uh, still, we need to we need to improve the regulation. In Indonesia, actually, we have done it very well in in terms of improving the transparency. Actually, I think it's better, much better. I mean, we have the limitation of donation, prohibition from uh, foreign uh, donations. Uh, only we don't have this expenditure cap, and we don't have this candidacy debate for for the presidential and legislative. But the, the, the obligation to report, audit, we, we have it there. So the regulation is better. You, you raised very strong argument that why we should uh, focus on this regulation. But still, I think uh, because uh, uh, not only law enforcement should be addressed, but these locals, like the, 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 expended, the cap and expenditures also very important, I think. And the candidacy being that is not there, so you, you're free to do it. So we should also stop that. We should also fill that hole. I think the uh, the law reform, the, the the better regulation is still needed. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes. 
David Harper, <coughs> I'm a colleague of Colleen Lewis who's on the Council of the Grand Table. So I ask Alison the question which betrays my own ignorance. Is there any difference between a third party campaigner and an associated entity? In New South Wales, New South there South would Wales. be. Uh, we only recognise a third party campaigner and a third party <coughs> campaigner is that distinct, um, is, is very distinctly defined as an entity that's not a candidate party and so forth, who operates for that limited six month period um, and incurs that limited form of expenditure. So an associated entity that, that I would <coughs> like to see um, recognised in the New South Wales law would be a third party campaigner on steroids. We would see what that entity and person does for the other 3.5 um, years of the election cycle and who they do it with and who they do it for. So a TPC is, is, is an associated entity, but for a limited period of time and without all those extra sort of things that, that we should know about them. So the associate entity, an, an entity is associate entity by virtue of the character of the relationship with the political party, whereas a third party campaigner is a third party campaigner by virtue of what they spend. Mm. If that makes sense. So you spend two thousand dollars in a particular period, you become a third party campaigner. If you have a particular relationship with a political party, you become associate entity. <coughs> and, but they, one can actually be both, yeah. right? You can actually spend above certain amount. And was, uh, I mean, trade unions are associate entities under the federal law, as well as third party campaigners mm -hmm. when they spend. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, my name is Mia. I'm from the Australia Association of this. And my question is for Professor Isriana. Yes. You show us some uh, statistics, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to people of women, mm -hmm. or uh, how you know, the, the requirement, you know, the candidate yes. declares their, their work. Can you tell us, uh, give us more information about what, uh, what activity is happening? How, what are you, is there something happening to educate in the nation about those issues? Yes, of course there are activities, but obviously, obviously not enough. If you see the figures, I mean, uh, the, the, the people based on the KPK survey, uh, yeah, the Co Corruption and Education Commission, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, more than 65 percent don't know that there is actually limitation on donations. So the 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 electoral commission supposed to do this uh, public education. Uh, I think who, who should <laughs> I can only think about the electoral commission, but of course the others uh, parties should also do the same thing. But parties actually uh, one of the. Uh, 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 a problem maker, not a problem solver. So, so yeah. <laughs> NGOs. NGOs, of course, yeah. So that, that Paludum that I said earlier uh, is one of the very well-known NGOs in Indonesia in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, elect uh, electoral education. So yes, we did, we do some, uh, some, some uh, public education, but unfortunately, uh, the, the voting behavior is uh, see, still shows that uh, money politic, uh, vote buying. Uh, when I when I talk about money politic in Indonesia, usually it's co uh, closely related to vote buying. It's still it's still very 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 uh, uh, sharply uh, common in Indonesia. Yeah. Yes. Can I just add quickly to that? Um, ah, yes, yes. I was at the Asia Foundation when one of the two million from survey was. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> 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 my name's Tim, I'm the editor of the Indonesia at Melbourne Blog. Uh, but in 2014, I was working at the Asia Foundation when oh, of course, one yes. of those surveys uh, that Tim pointed to yes, was yes. done. And interestingly, although 50% of people said they'd be willing to accept money, 75% said that it wouldn't affect their voting choice. Yes, <laughs> they actually fought for, not for the one that gives you the money. So they received the money, but for, fought for other candidates. But <laughs> vote buying and secret ballots. <laughs> so that's actually that campaign. You can receive the money, but don't vote for him. For some yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to help out the banks with a bit of guidance for the next election. Um, yes, please. <coughs> Sorry. I was wondering what the Indonesian people would think about the people in this room tonight discussing corruption in Indonesia. Well, let's ask the Indonesians. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry? <laughs> the question was, what would Indonesian people think about the people in this room discussing corruption in Indonesia? <laughs> <laughs> You're Indonesian. <laughs> what do you think Indonesians would feel about Indonesia and corruption being discussed tonight? <laughs> what you, but you don't know. What you don't know is I'm a suspect of corruption case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am. So actually, it's, it's awkward for me to discuss about corruption in Indonesia because I'm one of the suspects uh, named by the police. Uh, more than one year ago, and I rescued by, by Professor Tim here, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, Indonesia now, we have, almost every day we discuss about corruption. Uh, uh, how do you think you will get uh, an overseas country, another country, discussing the UN's corruption? I don't think there is no pr <laughs> any problem of that. I mean, I mean, maybe in, in the past, under the Suarto's regime, Suarto authoritarian regime, we will have problems. But now, Indonesia is more democratic. You know, in the past, the media cannot cover about corruption cases. It will be very <coughs> difficult for them. But now, every day, we have corruption cases everywhere, in media and televisions, and also, if you discuss it here, wherever, in the, I mean, in other countries, no problems, but yeah, sometimes, not sometimes, many of the time I feel sad because of that, but that's just the fact. We have to address this. This is one of the, the main problems in our country. We have to combat corruption very progressively. I think we have another contribution from another Indonesian on this point. <laughs> <laughs> Aldrin. Yeah, sure. I'm Aldrin. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, I just can't say this. Like, we, are, we are growing actually in terms of like, freedom of expression. Yes. And now we can talk about everything. Else. And it's like, I can say that Indonesian people now is more open minded, like me and like you and like everyone here. So, and that's why, yeah, 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 it, it's not just, yeah, we just, I just want to um, emphasize that, like, do you feel Indonesian people right now, comparing to what you knew, like, 10 years ago, you talk to people, or the more educated people back then, and it's like, you are really young, you are young, so I think, <coughs> Yeah, you do. I just wanted to Name and affiliation. Uh, Elizabeth Haynes Brooks, alumni of Monash. Okay. I just wondered um, if you have a perception that there is a difference in, in terms of the regions where Sharia law has been enforced, in, in terms of the electoral, electoral process. Do you perceive that there's a difference? You mean in Aceh? Because it, it's only applied there, actually. Uh, I I I am not the expert on 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 Aceh. I mean, I'm, I, I so so it's very difficult to 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 guess. But uh, when when the party, the local party, we have local party in Aceh. Uh, not the other provinces actually does not rec uh, do not recognize local parties. Only national one. When the local party party tried to 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 uh, uh, to s their campaign about Sharia law, actually, actually, not that accepted a thing by the by the Acehnese. I mean, I mean, from from my understanding, uh, is actually used by the elite. Uh, but when you go to the lower level, the the the, the root. The, the 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 people in grassroots, uh, there are many questions about uh, applying Sharia, and however, uh, the Aceh uh, party, uh, the uh, the Free Aceh actually based on the the Free Aceh movement won the elections maybe because they 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 managed to 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 raise the issue on you know uh, uh, greater Aceh uh, more freedom for Aceh. Not, not uh, uh, specifically on the on the Sharia. I, I would argue. I would. Uh, he, he's actually one of them. Now, what about the question of corruption in Aceh, by comparison? That's really your question. Is there corruption or more? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Less well, it's a serious issue in Aceh. Uh, the same thing with with Papua. When Aceh and Papua actually has special autonomy, 
and um, more money actually distributed to Aceh and, and also Papua. And there are, there are actually corruption cases. Uh, one of the cases actually uh, handled by the Corruption Education Commission, actually uh, the governor of Aceh, uh, actually the first, one of the first cases handled by the Corruption Education Commission. Uh, so there are, there are actually corruption cases, uh, but uh, somehow, especially, uh, not especially in Papua, there is some uh, kind of political uh, quote unquote agreement that you know the law enforcement you know not that enforced in in terms of this because we we try to manage the 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 the, uh, the, the, the free movement either in Aceh or in Papua. So you know politically also there is some consideration. To, to handle the cases in Aceh and Papua, although it is not said publicly, but you know, uh, there are cases, but uh, more cases actually settled behind, uh, not based on the legal approach, but more political approach. I know this more about in Papua, but I, I also know some in Aceh as well. Can okay, I, can I just make, uh, uh, sorry, just a quick comment. Um, one thing that I think is going to be something that we'll, um, focus on more and more is the question of not so much foreign, foreign straight out foreign bribery of politicians, but if you like, foreign soft money. Um, and like me, mm. let's, let's call it the dark money. And certainly on, um, from say trips to Lombok, I know that one thing that's discussed is the amount of Saudi money that comes in mm -hmm. and is building um, uh, infrastructure of their choosing, right? Okay, I will bring it to Australia. Um, there is no doubt there's huge amounts of Chinese money coming in here. I, I experienced this in my own electorate because I had a significant Chinese constituency. Um, and that money would be used, um, it took me a while to you know, catch on to this, you know, a bit of a slow learner. Uh, but that money was specifically being used for Chinese language programs in particular schools. It was being used for particular overseas trips for certain principals in certain schools in that area. And you might say, oh, oh well, that's fairly benign. But then at what point does it become a rather awkward conversation with a set of elected representatives about we want this particular program funded in your Department of Education, right? And actually, this is, this is, this is reasonably direct, you know, um, um, this is a direct way of influencing, quite frankly, from the powers that be in, in Beijing. Mm. So I think these... The, we're going to have to sort of grapple with more, and more, and more of this, and it's not a million miles from mm. some of the things you're you're dealing mm. with as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take. I think we've got two last questions. So we take these two here. Um, I'll, just <coughs> take, I'll take both the questions and then get answers. Okay. So, so Wendy Miller, I'm a, a tutor in development studies at Melbourne University. Um, I just want to ask Maxine. Um, just your talk before about the corruption in the education department in Victoria. Mm. Um, when I heard about that happening, I was I thought automatically of the cases with the uh, federal department, the Wheat Board, I think it was. Yes. Um, and also in the Treasury, in terms of um, security. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And and I I just can't recall what were the consequences of those. Did any heads roll or? And just mm. on the case you mentioned about the Chinese language in schools. You're probably aware at Northcote High School at the moment is in a bit of a dilemma. Uh, they're dropping the teaching of Italian, which they've had for quite some time because of the strong Italian community there and replacing it with Chinese language. Um, so, yeah, it's starting to make sense. Mm. I guess in that case, yes, you might yeah. want to comment on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Hold yeah. Sure. Sure. Question, My question is about the... <laughs> oh, sorry, Boris Alexander, General Council. Uh, my question is about the evolution of things in Australia and it's basically to the two Australians. I mean, my interest was that from Indonesia we heard quite clearly that it, they're very aware that the major holders of newspaper, private owners, mm -hmm. do have a huge influence and we have. Uh, there's been, it's clear in Australia and indeed in Britain and the United States that the major holder of, of large numbers of newspaper, Rupert Murdoch, has for years and years uh, affected elections, uh, in Europe, including 1997 and 2007. But my question really is about the evolution. We talk about New South Wales having done something uh, in Parliament. Clearly, we had we know 
that there was a very good I, I back was it I back <laughs> the New South Wales okay. uh, um, investigation, which brought out clearly to the public that people like Arthur Zenadina uh, were using the system uh, and not admitting that they were collecting money. Uh, oh, I'll I'll just be careful on that one. I'll be that's well, that, was, yeah, that was the public's uh, my impression. Although yeah, I, I was going to say there were plenty of um, um, polit state the politicians in that category. The synod, the synodinus issue is me. is somewhat different. No, no, okay, but go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to sue me. I'm happy for him to sue me. But my question then is: Do we think that perhaps this sort of process may be moving, and in particular in relation to the ABC, it did seem in the last election that though the Australian had a very clear, there was no doubt what the Australian was doing. But on the ABC, more and more was setting the agenda on politics. Okay, that we, we don't have to cut is, that a, <laughs> is that a light at the end of the tunnel, that we could perhaps have this disclosure of corruption through the processes and then a follow-up that people with money just can't buy their way to power? Uh, I'll give it. Um, I'll mention this in uh, News Limited's favour. We only know about the children overboard um, um, scandal, and um, and the the way Peter Reith, I think, completely abused his office uh, because of investigative reporting um, by the Australian. Right. Okay. Um, I'll come to the present. The idea that um, newspapers now influence um, elections um, is is. Um, it's gone. It's gone. You, mm. I picked up the age today. There, are, there must have been four pages. Well, no, yesterday there must have been four pages in it. Every editorial, every editorial um, uh, in the election this year um, gave an overwhelming endorsement for Turnbull, and he was left, you know, hanging on a cliff. Um, editorials don't um, have an influence these days. They, they just don't. Um, um, the Australian will probably survive for about five minutes after Rupert Murdoch's death, you know, and it got, he can't live forever, you know. <laughs> um, so I just, th I think this is, um, I really think this is overblown. I'm not saying that in years past, clearly if you go back um, to the 70s, I mean, Murdoch had a huge influence with his, his papers. It is just not the force that it was. We are living in a far more fragmented media environment. Is, is there any uh, ownership limitation media? Um, uh, no, we have a very concentrated media. However, it's, I, I, I almost I suppose I can contradict myself. We have high concentration in print um, and in free to air. But as I say, you now have a proliferation. I mean, any day, I'm sure everyone in this room would be like it. You would read, get far more richer content from a range of on, uh, online journals than you would out of Fairfax or News Limited. You know, Fairfax will not be publishing a print edition for much longer. Um, um, more to the pity. But I have to say, um, you know, I'll, I'll always give the ABC a rap. I was, you know, a product of the ABC for 30 years. Their investigative reporting um, um, in recent times has been e exceptional. Um, it always has been, but it, it critically put. But I have to say, again, I've been nasty to Fairfax. Th there have been joint investigations between Fairfax and the ABC, which have been terribly important in the last couple of years. But it's a, it's a much more complex picture than saying, Rupert Murdoch says this, therefore this happens. It doesn't work like that. Did you want to answer the, the, the first question? The first question? Yes. <laughs> Um, it just there was the corruption uh, in the, 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 the look institution. Well, look, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned the the wheat board, yeah. um, and well, we sorry, we, wheat we wheat had a basket. very significant public inquiry on that that went for a very long mm -hmm. time. Um, and Kevin Rudd made a big name for himself during that inquiry because he was shadow foreign affairs minister. Um, but I'm just trying to think. Um, no ministerial heads rolled over that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Reserve Bank. Much the same thing. Um, I think it um, it points to the fact that I've been I've grown up, I suppose, always notwithstanding what I said about Queensland, more or less thinking, well, this is a clean country. You know, we our processes are pretty good. This is an honest, um, un, you know, this is a society that is not corrupt. But I have to say, there have been so many warning signals, haven't there? There's a lot of red lights going off now. And I come back to how grumpy the electorate feels. It's because people can see that whether it, whether it's a bank or whether it's some other institution, they're being a bit dudded. Yeah. And and it it's comes back to what Alison said. When you do not have role goal transparency, and and transparency requires champions, um, 
Um, and we need champions in our public life of exactly what you're talking about. Mm. Well, there we have an answer to the question of what to do next. We need to find some champions. <laughs> I think on that note, <laughs> apart from the ones at the front, that is, <laughs> I think on that note we'll, we'll stop. And I'd like to now call on Helen Palfacher, the Deputy Director for the Centre mm. for News and Law Islamic Society, to provide the vote of thanks. Thanks. So before I propose the vote of thanks, um, it's a commercial break, but this is not an opportunity <laughs> to run and get a cup of coffee or do other things, which I'll be very brief. But you can just quickly note that if you want to be on the mailing list for either of these centres, uh, please feel free to contact and you'll get an email uh, about any events that are coming up. Oops, still going that way. And the other thing is, now, the Centre for Indonesia Law, Islam and Society has got our events up. I'm afraid that the RRA hasn't. So we get <laughs> <laughs> Again, these are the events that are coming up. If you go to the website, um, you can look them up there. So you don't need to write them all down. But we'll urge you that they're coming. And one of the things that will be coming is we'll have Denny back with us again. So if you enjoyed hearing him tonight, come mm. again because he'll get an even Indeed. bigger spot there. <laughs> Now, Tim started this evening by saying how different our systems were, which is true, but one of the things that I think we benefit from tonight, from having our three speakers all together, is the idea that, in fact, the problems, whilst slightly different, are nevertheless very similar in the different countries. And I think it's a, a great thing to be able to have two countries together rather than simply looking at the system of one country to get an idea of what sort of problems there are and what sort of solutions have been found. So I'd like to thank all three speakers as a group for providing us with that depth and breadth. And do John. And do John. <laughs> 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 so I like, to thank uh, Denny. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank, oh, you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just thank you, Chong. Right. He's, <laughs> he's a university employee, That's so it's right a bit it. corrupt to pay him. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, is that right? That's a nice one too. And I'd like to uh, thank the McDougal Trust uh, again for funding the video recording and to uh, Jim, Jimmy Seary uh, for doing the recording on the night. <laughs> And this seminar could not have happened um, without the admin support that we've had. And I'd particularly like to thank Catherine Taylor, Adisa Harto from Stillis, and Catherine Lee from ERRN, and also Tim Nan, who's been tweeting. If you've heard a little chip, 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 that's been <laughs> in the corner there. So thank you very much to all the people who did all the hard work in putting this seminar together. Thank you to the audience.